My name is Julie Loken. For more than 40 years, I uh, have been producing concerts with a partner, Art Wiener, and the name of the company was called New Audiences Productions. Well, jazz is my first love, and many of the shows that we did were with some of the greats. We were in the right place at the right time in terms of the uh, the uh, the notables in the jazz world, including uh, Charles Mingus and Miles Davis and Sonny Rollins and uh, Rasan Roland Kirk and uh, Dizzy Gillespie, the Basie Band, the Eckstein Band, Sarah Vaughan, uh, many, many. And uh, but we also did other shows. We did blue shows with people like Muddy Waters, Lightning Hopkins, Sonny Terry Brown and McGee, Howlin' Wolf, uh, many, many uh, blue shows. Uh, going back to the early days of our business, the uh, uh, 70s and 80s, uh, the summers were very slow for us because, uh, uh, number one, uh, uh, one of the venues that we uh, did many shows in Carnegie Hall was closed for the summer, so we couldn't do anything in the summer. There were also competition with a lot of free outdoor shows, so it was very hard to get people to buy tickets for um, concert for theater shows. So uh, we, uh, I had a very close working relationship with George Ween, the the maestro of uh, of concert production, and George, at that time did many tours uh, in Europe in July. July is a big month for jazz festivals in Europe. Nice, Montreux, uh, Umbria in Italy, uh, Puri in Finland, and on and on. There were many shows, and George uh, was like the man on the spot, and he would put the bands together and put them on tour in Europe. And uh, I got lucky. Uh, uh, George picked me as the big band specialist. I, I went out with uh, Woody Herman a couple of times, uh, the Jerry Mulligan uh, Country Jazz Band. I went out with, uh, uh, I don't know, did I say Buddy Rich? Uh, the, uh, Basie had already been gone, but they put together a, uh, a Basie uh, uh, alumni band with Joe Williams and the special guest and Fat Jones as the musical director one time and uh, Frank Forster another time. So in a way, I had a pinch, often I had to pinch myself to say, I cannot believe this is work. Every night I would hear this incredible music and um, <clears throat> and be at these wonderful jazz festivals where I could also hear all these other great artists. And one year, George called me and said, how would you like to go out with the Brucker Brothers? And I knew the Brucker Brothers. They were basically my age, and I had done shows with them. One of my favorite Brucker Brothers show was uh, on a double bill with Tower of Power, Tower of Power and the Brecker Brothers, a, a serious horn show. And uh, that did very well. And uh, when George asked me to go out with the brothers, I was thrilled. That was not only that, it, instead of being on a road with 16 or 17 guys, it was a band of uh, a, six, a sextet, basically. So uh, and it, it was it was challenging, but it was fun. You know, I basically was a tour manager, road manager. There was a road manager. He's basically a sound guy and a lighting guy. I, and I basically did the business. So as a tour manager, um, number one, I, you know, this is before cell phones and before uh, internet. So um, it was trying to keep, it was like herding cats, trying to keep every, and literally and figuratively keeping the cats together. And, uh, Making sure they uh, got up in time to go to the uh, to get, make the the plane or the bus or whatever, and and also the business part, making sure everybody got paid and contracts were in order, and uh, in some cases dealing with um, uh, TV rights because many of those European festivals had uh, funding from. The, uh, pu the public TV station, the national TV. And he, so it was interfacing with those guys and making sure that, uh, but it was also um, advocating for the band, making sure they got protected uh, in terms of what their rights were uh, as touring artists. So uh, uh, it was, um, of course, there were situations where uh, somebody would lose a passport once in a while or uh, what happened to the base? We got all the luggage, but where's the base? And then I had to go find uh, uh, the uh, the base, or get 
a porter or somebody to you know describe what a contrabass is and uh, and get it for the band. So it, it was a multitude of uh, little, of little chores, but it was fun. It was probably the most fun part of uh, my career. Uh, the audience uh, was great because it was not only um, the audiences were um, jazz fans, but there were also many youthful. Uh, a lot of young people who, uh, because they they were edgy and almost on uh, the verge, uh, on the, almost like rock and roll. So, for example, um, we played uh, the Roskilde Festival in Denmark, which is a major, major rock festival, and the audience loved it. The audience loved it. Uh, the uh, Breakfast also had hits at that time. They had a couple of songs that got played, like Skunk Funk and. Uh, Oh, there was uh, another one that was got, got played on on the radio in some of the European Sneak. countries. So they were celebrities. Sneaking up behind you. Sneaking up behind you, exactly. There, there was one funny incident on that tour um, where we were driving from Denmark to um, West Germany. And, uh, you know, the wall hadn't uh, been built and, and, and it was still communist uh, uh, Germany. Uh, East Germany, and uh, the uh, the local promoter gets on the bus with us and said, "Look, you're going to be crossing a border from East Germany into West Germany, and the East Germans are not nice people necessarily. So if you got anything to get rid of, do it now before we get to the border." And all of a sudden, everybody was swallowing and smoking and doing everything they had, <laughs> and basically. It turned out to be a big nothing because we got to the border and this uh, very stern looking uh, East German soldier border guard gets on the bus. He says, Passaporte, everybody, hold up. Everybody takes their passport and shows it. He says, OK, go. <laughs> uh, nowadays, uh, again, communication is so much better, you know, with, with cell phones and Internet and uh, uh, so you could actually uh, uh, advance the next date very easily, which wasn't always the case. You'd show up, especially in Italy, and you know you'd find things that you didn't expect. I say especially in Italy because no, Italy is notorious for being un untogether and uh, beautiful place, great food, beautiful women. Everything was wonderful about it, except. Production values weren't always up to snuff, but uh, that's very different now. That's and uh, a lot of times when people go on tour, the dates are like backed up right next to each other. You're up at six in the morning. You're playing that night. I mean, was it that kind of a tour? Yeah, often that's the case. I mean, the, the, and, uh, you know, again, George, in, in the case of George Ween, where he was the, uh, the tour promoter, as it were, he didn't, he had, he ran his own festival in Nice. So, uh, especially with the big bands that I was playing in, that's a lot of hotel rooms to pay for if you're out in some other place. So he, it was better for him to bring everybody to Nice and do a performance there where he had deals with hotels and uh, it was his own festival. So he could schedule stuff at the last minute if there were open dates. Um, so Breckers just did a regular, as I recall, just did a uh, a regular one night in, in Nice. But uh, it's, um, you know, the financial part of it is uh, is uh, make it or break it for a tour. You know, if, uh, you know, you get a couple of nights that aren't booked, that could be the profit for the whole tour. So that kept the bands working. Breckers couldn't have been nicer to me than 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 they were. They really were, and and not only not only that because they were young guys. I was a young guy. Uh, they had respect for the music that, as you had mentioned earlier, very kindly mentioned that I did some really great shows, and they were very cognizant of that. And yeah. uh, they, um, you know, we'd be on the bus and say, "Julie, tell us a story," you know, kind of thing once in a while. So it was cool. It was very, very cool. And and uh, I'm very, very fortunate to have ex uh, that experience.
typecast as as a uh, you know recording musicians because the records come out and stay there and people see the records. But you know somehow you know we're, we've contributed as much time to playing live more so. Like today was the first day I've played electric in a long time, and I'll just start screwing around with it every concert until I find from what I've seen just you find your own set of sounds that you, you that you can utilize that sound good to you that that uh, project your ideas the best and then you kind of stay within that realm because a synthesizer can it can basically create any kind of sound so you have an infinite variety of sounds to make but the the way to approach it i think is just to find the few sounds which you know you can utilize kind of work I do with sound is in terms of equipment, in terms of the saxophone, the mouthpiece, the reed. I find the rest of it takes care of itself somehow, just the way your throat is structured and your lips and body and the way, you, basically the way your ears hear it. Somehow the saxophone is the kind of instrument that everyone who plays it sounds different. And uh, it's partially because uh, it really takes on the characteristics of the person themselves. It's a very personal instrument.
on the regular on the tenor saxophone. Barry Finnerty on guitar. Mark Gray on keyboards. Steel Jason on bass. Richard Morales on drums. A beautiful audience. We'll see you soon, we hope. Thank you.